So I'm going to be talking about continuous integration and delivery tonight. I think I have this slide deck trimmed up just right. It was for a three-hour workshop that I just did, so I still have remnants of that in my head. Um, so I'm going to try to stay on a good track so that we're not here till like midnight. My name is Adrian. I write code, and I've written code for a lot of really, really large companies with like 200,000 people, and I've written code for companies the size of me. Currently, I live in Portland. Probably will do that for a long time. That was one of the slides I should have got rid of. So, <laughs> continuous integration and continuous delivery, I kind of split into two stories. But first, I'm going to tell you two stories about some companies that I have worked for in the past. One was a startup, and it was actually the company where I first cut my teeth doing some continuous integration. We had been building a product for about six months. We had done no continuous integration, no continuous delivery. We did have some tests a little bit, not 100%, but we were doing pretty good with it. And we were pretty happy with it because we were able to deploy it manually and get it out there in pretty good condition. It started taking a little bit longer and a little bit longer though. And then one day we deployed. I won't say what day we deployed it on. But needless to say, the next three days were pretty rough and then on Tuesday we were really relieved when we finally got it to work again. And the, <laughs> the reason it took so long was because we had all these commits and all this stuff in the code base and mostly test covered but in the end, we made a little tweak and it kind of rippled through the code base and caused us a whole host of issues. Kind of to learn that lesson exponentially worse, I was working for an enterprise at a later time. And we had multiple departments, like a QA department had multiple people in it. We had a UAT group, which was users that would prospectively be using the application and it had I don't even know how many, probably 30 people working in that group that would provide feedback every time we deployed into that environment. We had a secondary dev team, and we all kind of contributed into a section. And strangely enough, we were able to build the application that we were building and get it deployed in this weird manual process that took about 20 minutes at a time. And the same thing happened, though. We were doing that, and most of us at the time realized two things. One, we were going to get it eventually because we knew better. We knew we should be doing some type of integration testing and other things like that. But we kind of knew we were on a death march. But we were told to do that. We kept doing it. And then one day, we deployed it. It didn't quite work. We tried to roll it back. Our rollback didn't quite work. All these problems just tumbled. And instead of three days, we spent like two weeks. Tons of people in the company spent this time so just think about a burn rate. You got dozens and dozens and dozens of people being paid to basically troubleshoot something that you have no idea what's wrong. So we spent those weeks doing that. Tons of hours. It was ridiculous. So those two situations kind of come to my to the forefront every time I think about continuous integration, a step past that, continuous delivery, to really drive home the point. When you have continuous integration and continuous delivery, you always see, you're always getting feedback and interaction with your systems so that you don't run into these horror stories and you can avoid the Friday deploy. You don't want that to happen. It's horrible. Who's had a Friday deploy? Come on, at least one or two people, yeah. And then it's like Tuesday or Thursday and you're like, oh, it's almost Friday again. At least I'll get to go have a beer or something. <laughs> ah, so brutal. So really, the way to prevent this is ridiculously simple. You want to increase your knowledge of your system. You want to know what's in it at every, every point. More than just your code, you want to know where your code's going. What is it going to run on? Who else is going to touch it? What else does it need to kind of interoperate with? You need to gain that visibility into your code and into your systems. That's usually important too. A lot of the time people are like, I have code, and then they could put that sticker on the computer that says, works on my machine, it's fine. It doesn't work for anybody else, it makes it useless. 
And of course, repeatability is huge. Every time you deploy, is it working? Is something breaking? You know, it seems like such a simple thing, but it's huge, 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 huge. The easiest way to tie those together is with continuous integration. There's, of course, the initial expenditure from manager talk. I would say, yeah, throw CapEx at it. It's not really a big deal. Somebody spends a few days or hours or weeks. It might seem like a lot up front, but anybody that does continuous integration knows that it pays itself back big time. Operationally, it makes your life smoother. Because when you deploy code, the integration does whatever it's going to do, build stuff, run some tests, checks out some things, and it tells you immediately, did your build break? Yes, no. Did your test pass? Yes, no. It's easy. Immediate feedback. It's a good feedback loop. If you deploy that somewhere and you throw it over to like a QA department, they come back a week later and say, hey, so I had these bugs. Did you not do anything for a week? I've seen environments where this happens, and it's, it's quite ridiculous. They come back with the bugs, and you're like, oh, I think I fixed half of those, and we've moved on to other things. So you need that immediate feedback loop to really, really build in that consistent quality. The other thing it tells you is that your build builds on all the machines, not just yours. That's super helpful. One of the things I think of when I talk about continuous integration too is it's kind of singular in scope. And the reason I say that is when you have that, it's kind of your machine and then wherever that build is happening. If you have Jenkins or something like that, it's very important to notice that scope because it's not systemic. Who, who builds a single page app in here? Anybody been working on one of those? So it connects to an API, right? Maybe more than one API. How many does the one you're working on connect to? One. Just one? You're a lucky person. <laughs> who, who has one that accesses more than that? Yeah, you got two? Are they both, like, are, you, are they under your control or are they out somewhere else? Uh, they're both under our control. Uh, you're, that's pretty lucky, too. <laughs> I built one recently. It had uh, nine direct APIs. And then... Some data was retrieved sporadically, depending on where you were working on this page, from something like 32 to 34 other API sources. Some were under the control of the team, some were not. Those were always scary. Continuous integration doesn't tell you where all those are. Like if you have continuous integration on your single page app and you run you get Angular or React or whatever it is, and then you run the test, and you get a good thumbs up on that, and it like tries, it, maybe it runs it on the server, and it's like, okay, we've got that, and maybe you run some Selenium tests or something like that. That tells you that, but it doesn't tell you anything about the APIs you connect to. And if your APIs are broken and it relies on those to do tests, then, then you've got another issue because you're like, wait, did my page break or did the, did the other things break? Like, what's actually broken? It's kind of tough. So that's where moving past continuous integration and that, that singular scope is super important. And that's kind of where you step from the, the somewhat fuzzy line of continuous integration over to continuous delivery. The question comes up, so how do you, how do you get continuous delivery happening? Some companies have it happening. Um, let's see here, what's a, what's a well-known one? Etsy. Who knows what Etsy is? I know there's at least, yeah, there we go. Etsy. People make stuff, they sell it, et cetera, and they have a continuous delivery cycle going on. Where every time somebody gets something pushed into that trunk that's deployed, it goes live, usually multiple times a day. Um, I hear, myth, I haven't seen this yet. Maybe they'll invite me and I can come see it one day. But I hear that the first day someone sits down on the job, they're taught how to deploy code, and then they deploy code to production. I can believe it. I actually worked, scarily enough, at a financial institution. We did that. So whenever you have your money in your bank, think about that. <laughs> um, but it was, it was good. It builds a lot of confidence. When you have enough trust in your systems, 
that you can do that. But to get to a con continuous delivery point of functionality, there's a lot of things we got to do. We're going to extend everything we have in integration, right? So we, we build our knowledge, visibility, and repeatability, and it goes even further. We have more repeatability of more systems, of more integration, of more code, et cetera. And again, same thing with CapEx. Yes, it costs time initially. Pays itself back in lower, less frustrating days operationally. And it extends what you can actually build during a period of time. It also goes from, like with continuous integration, it's very kind of like a tactical thing. It's like very close to you. But continuous delivery moves it out to a very high level strategic point. One of the things I, I've often looked at is I try to actually work continuous delivery systems into a way, and this is kind of scary, where you actually have, whatever you want to call it, managers or leadership looking at things that come from that process. Because you can actually make it tell them things that they want to know, and then you don't have to continue to update them on things, which is, which is tremendously helpful when what you want to do is get to building stuff and be building things. And it goes past the singular scope to all the machines, building the builds. It adds in DevOps aspects, unit testing aspects, onto like client-side UI, Selenium tests, which goes from unit to integration to, I guess what you could call even like systemic tests, where a system tests another system tests another system to verify that all the pieces are actually in place. When you move from continuous integration to continuous delivery, one of the things that I see happen a lot is it gets real easy, but even in the case of Etsy, they still have rollback. Always think about rollback. It may fail, so be able to roll back. Sometimes it's tough, sometimes it takes more capital effort to sit down and build a rollback system or to integrate with a rollback system, but it's very important to do. So at this point in my workshop, I actually said, all right, everybody jump into and try out a continuous integration. And what we did was we put together a quick little thing where we put some uh, repo in GitHub and then tied code ship to GitHub. So if you want to try out continuous integration, I would highly suggest to try out something like CodeShip or one of the slightly more developed continuous integration services and just tie it to your repo. Make a simple app, nothing advanced. It could be hello world. Throw in a basic test to it and then hook it up in CodeShip and just get a, get a look at how that runs against an environment like that. Then from there, start figuring out ways that you can build on it. Because at first you get just got your app, whatever, very simple. But then just add some complexity to it and try to keep it in that loop. You'll start figuring out things really quickly that mess your continuous integration up. <laughs> and it's great to be able to have tools like CodeShip and GitHub and all those things these days to be able to really play with that and see what's going to break it and see how you need to extend it for things that you actually want to put in place in a production type environment where you're going to eventually have it deployed to production. So one of the things, too, in regards to all of this, with continuous integration, another way to think of that type of systemic usage is use it for yourself. Matter of fact, get yourself a continuous integration server and just use it for your own code projects. It takes like 30 seconds to hook up CodeShip to one of your personal repos. And just leave it on. See how often you commit broken code to your own personal projects that you're toying around with. It's a great way to like get, get feedback of how you step through solving problems and things like that. And if you focus on keeping the light green and keeping successful builds happening and your tests happy, you'll find that you change the way you move through code and the way you write code if you have your own little check there. Um, 
it also helps when you're working with other people. You get into the habit of not ever committing anything that's broken. And you have less for them to check. Because ideally, already, you don't commit broken code, right? I mean, nobody does that. <laughs> um, I saw a cartoon today where this one person's going, oh, get, get log out. Oh, crap, it's not me, not me, not me, not me. Oh, it is me. <laughs> I'm like, yep, been there, done that. That's, that's about when you're like, N nothing happened here. Hold on, I'm putting it back, putting it back. <laughs> so always good to have a personal CI server running. Some type of thing that's going to check your stuff before it goes into a big queue. And then, of course, to have the main queue. When I use CodeShip, it's going to be a loud sound. I just smacked the mic really hard. <laughs> Whenever I use CodeShip or any of the other build servers, I always set up my build, and then I start working on the main one. It's going to go off a master or whatever in some you know, main company branch. And it, and it really helps just to get started that way. Um, you, do, you do find out quickly, too. One of the first things I always find is your configuration. You'll notice, oh, wait, I, I need two. So immediately you'll start building those, like, pieces of that system, of that app that you will need to get to that point to move smoothly into production in between systems without hiccups. So at this point I've, I've covered continuous integration, continuous delivery. Any questions or thoughts? Who, who does some form of one or the other right now? Hold on, one, two, oh, eight, seven. Mm, not a, that's not too bad of a ratio. That's what I'm kind of used to, though. Seems like 10, 20% of companies tend to do it. Um, I will tell you, though, push hard to get these things put into place. You will get to go home and relax more easily. You won't be spending Saturday and Sundays and other random arbitrary days like Christmas or something sitting, banging away at some code, everything will get smoother if you get this stuff into place. It's just, it's a discipline, and you have to do it. Until you do it, it might seem fuzzy, but when you get them into place, it really does make life better. I, I have been very particular about it, and generally, if someone will ask me to consult for them, I say, do you have X, Y, Z things in place? That's one of them. If they say no, I sit down and say, all right, how many hours have you worked? And they're usually like, oh, I don't know, 90 hours in the last week. I'm like, well, okay, first fix that, and then we can talk about all the other things that you need to do. So that's like a step one. Get that in place. It makes life much, much easier when it comes to coding every day. So any thoughts about this? Who doesn't believe me? Anybody? Well, he raised his hand. Oh, he's moving the camera. <laughs> no? Is it? Yeah. I've got a question. Yeah, go for it. Um, so you mentioned using Selenium uh, mm -hmm. for, I don't know what you call it, uh, production testing and things like that. Yeah, well. I mean, I've done, I've used Selenium yeah. and it's, it's like arduous, I guess would be the word. Yeah. Um, I would call that UI testing in general. But. Yeah. I'm wondering, like, does something like Casper, you know, or some JavaScript tool that does the clicking get close enough? So. The thing with that is where you run into the, like, at some point you kind of need somebody to play with it. You, re you really want somebody to do that, because they're going to point out stuff that just doesn't flow right, too. And you start to run into that UX realm of, like, does it even, does it work for human beings when they're interacting with it? So that, that part really is just hard. But as far as clicking buttons, triggering user events from purely the client side, there are tools that help. Selenium is just one of them I mentioned because I've seen people implement it. I always feel like it's, it is very arduous. Like UI testing just seems that way. Because you're dealing with a lot of things where you need to put in delays and odd timing and stuff like that. And, it, and you also often run into situations where you're doing more of an integration versus a unit test. So you're kind of putting it into a queue and letting it process. Like let it hit all these buttons. Let it make the UI do all these things. It's a little time consuming. Um, so that, there are tools that will do the clicks for you. Will it really cover that aspect? I would say no. Um, you still need some human beings clicking away at it and looking at it frequently. Um, 
I've, I've not been convinced of a computer system that can go through and rip through like poking all the buttons and changing layouts and all that stuff and actually being able to analyze it completely. It's good to make sure like the, the fundamental pieces work and that beyond that, that's about it. So, are there any other questions? Uh, were, were, have you used any UI testing stuff before, like Casper? Or you were, uh, well, both Casper and Sony. Oh, okay, you were saying, okay. So, yeah. Gotcha. So you, you weren't just saying, you thought it was arduous, you were saying it's arduous. Well, <laughs> getting like any kind of UI changes, for example, at all, mm -hmm. you know, you've got to update the slide again. Yep. Um, yep. I mean, there's, yes. Yeah. Cool. I think Selenium has its place for UI testing all the way through. I think that there's a lot to be said for unit testing individual pieces of the UI. So having something that can use Phantom to, to and, and any any of the UI tool, testing tools like Fusion or Mocha or whatever to say here's a here's a div that has one piece of my UI and I'm gonna need to test to just operate against that and then if anything should like wrap or run that changes to the chair should be testing that thing. And that makes it a lot easier to then say, well I'm working on this piece of the UI, so I fix that test and you just compose all those yeah. See, UI, UI testing is hard. It doesn't matter if you're doing it for the web or, or whatever. It's it's tough. Um, I I honestly have never really gotten to the point where I am 100% sold on uh, like going one way more or the other when it comes to like having somebody go through the interface all the time or having kind of a mix or whatever. I definitely, if anything, I would prefer at least someone go through it on a regular basis than like purely only automated testing because something gets missed then and then you're going to have a user do something and they're like, well, when I moved this and put data in the table and then hit this other button, the whole page fell apart. And then you're like, the test passed. <laughs> it's kind of the same thing as like, it works on my machine, right? Well, sure, the test passed, but obviously it completely just nuked on, on that user. So now you're, you're back at like, well, how did that work? And you have to go through the whole thing again. So it's almost like, well, get somebody to do weird things to it, and you'll probably stumble into those things just as fast as, you know, well, I got all the automation tests to work, now I throw it over the, the wall to the end user, and then they're fiddling around, and something ends up breaking, and it's, it's just it's way more difficult to troubleshoot and resolve a UI error at that point than it is to have, like, someone in-house kind of poking around through it and getting, getting most of the baseline figured out there. Yeah. Sorry, I'm oh no, that's fine. That's fine. So we, we have um, in my company this kind of setup uh, where we use Selenium. We use a wrapper called Nightwatch, which just makes it nice to use JavaScript to use Selenium. I get it. And we do like major flows only, so we can test to oh, see yeah. something big is broken. Mm -hmm. We definitely don't want to deploy there, and this is part of our container integration stack. We just run. Cool. Time. And we also have an in -house, a small in-house QA team to make sure that it feels right also. They don't even have to test it when we've just like majorly broken everything. You know, we don't oh, have yeah. to give them a headache. It happens, <laughs> it happens all the time. Yeah. Um, and then uh, in another different vein, um, we, while I was here, we kind of got this continuous integration set up using Travis, connected to GitHub. Mm -hmm. um, and like <laughs> twice a day or something, we make pull requests and the tests fail. Maybe they just fail on whatever kind of Linux box Travis is using. They don't mm -hmm. rush a super good way to, to catch. How do, how do you guys launch the the tests with, with Travis? Um, like, do you just initiate like a script call to it or something yeah, like that? Some kind of script. Uh, we just have to yeah. test script or something. Cool. So, no, like, big, big glorious grunt task or anything like that? Uh, well, there's a lot of really big grunt tasks. I don't know if I'd call them glorious, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. All right, well, I'm just going to go through a few of the last bits. Um, some thoughts on how to approach CI and CD, things to keep like at the forefront. Um, and also mention, speaking of that, using Grunt or just a script, I've seen a number 
of blog entries. It's starting to look like Emacs versus VI. Uh, <laughs> one, one person, Keith Sirkel, I think is his name, uh, from the UK, wrote an article about why we should stop using Grunt. And he also means Gulp and some of the other ones. And what he states, in his opinion, is like, well, why not just use NPM scripts? Why not use, why not use Bash and the other things that have, done, that have been there? We all use that anyway to get all the pieces together in the first place. So why not automate that way? It's been there for a billion years. It works. Um, and he puts forward a good article and kind of challenges his team. He says, if, if we can't figure out how to do it in NPM scripts, he'll give up. They'll do grunt or gulp or whatever. No, no arguments, right? Um, and so far, it sounds like they've been working for well over a year and not done any of those frameworks that do tasking and all that kind of stuff. They've just put stuff into simple bash scripts, kept it really straightforward, and they hook them in via like NPM scripts. So the little section in NPM, the, your uh, JSON file there, There's a little script section just adds them there and then that's it. And then they have them run whatever they're going to run. So it's kind of an interesting perspective because it kind of folds into some of the other things. Whenever I think of CI, CD, one of the things that helps me in a big way is to think of the same things that I think about all the time when I'm doing software development. KISS, keep it simple, stupid. Yagni, you ain't going to need it, don't build it. Dry, don't repeat yourself. Clear separations of concerns, SOC. And solid, which I won't say them because I'll mess them up. But it's something like responsibility pattern, closed principle pattern, various patterns to make sure you're writing code that is maintainable over time and also clean in a way that you're not writing extra. You're not writing extra processing. You're not writing extra things that you don't need. Kind of, kind of a bigger, more glorified way of saying the first three. But same thing with continuous integration and continuous delivery. I have seen situations where people are just like, well, dupe this, dupe this, dupe this, copy this, then do this thing, and then the next thing they know they have umpteen duplications and there's a bunch of manual process every time they set up a continuous integration cycle or a delivery cycle. And it's like, no, don't do that. If you find yourself repeating something, even in this, in this automation process, wrap it up, write a script for it. Heck, write a grunt process, whatever, whatever it takes, but don't repeat parts of the process if it's doing effectively the same thing. Uh, and, and don't build things into the process. Heaven forbid, don't add steps that are unnecessary. Like if you get in your delivery process, oh, every time we do a delivery to the website, we're going to run 50,000 reports out of the delivery process cycle. Is that really part of delivery? Like running arbitrary reports that aren't actually related to the product getting delivered? I've seen that where they're like, oh, well, we'll send this off and queue it up. And then the delivery cycle actually waits for reports to run that people look at that didn't actually have anything to do with the delivery of it. They just wanted to update them every time they deliver a product. So kind of think of continuous integration and continuous delivery just like the actual software and the code that you're writing in projects. Keep the principles in mind. I promise that'll help doing CI, CD over time. And also, one of the things that I've been thinking about is code smells and build smells. I've been thinking like, I had to roll something together and build a book. If somebody has not already done this, it usually happens to me. Every time I think I'm going to write a book or something, I'm like, oh, look, there's that book I was going to write. That's awesome. I don't have to do it now. Um, <laughs> but build smells, there's definitely some of, them out, some of them out there, like what I was just talking about with the reporting. That blew me away. I saw this continuous delivery cycle. Somebody's like, oh yeah, you just put in a, you put in a PR and then somebody okays it and it goes in the build and the whole delivery starts. And then I'm like, all right, cool. So I did that one day and then like an hour later or something, I, I'm like, what's, where, where's my stuff? It's just, it should be done now, right? Somebody goes, oh no, it usually takes two or three hours because the reports have to run. <laughs> like, <laughs> what reports? There's no reports in the app. And they go, oh no, no the reports that go to management. Like, what's that tell them? Oh, something about the data and some numbers and whatever. And I'm like, that has, that's like completely autonomous of this whole process. Can we please like put that on a cron job or something? 
I mean, or some post, like, at least shoot it off asynchronously. Jeez, don't put it in the delivery cycle. So, I don't know, maybe that'll be the first build smell. If somebody hasn't beat me to the book, that's probably going to be the one. Don't put report processing in your continuous delivery cycle. So that's, that's kind of the, the whole gist of what I wanted to talk about. Kind of, kind of pitch everybody on continuous integration, continuous delivery. I am a big advocate, if anybody can tell. Do it. It will save lives, probably. Um, it's kind of fun, too. Like, some people actually do this stuff for a living. Like, they actually do just, they build continuous integration and continuous delivery processes for companies. It's kind of neat. But uh, the biggest thing is just it will, it will make your life better. You won't be stuck chasing down problems that should be, be able to be figured out in, like, 10 seconds. It just removes that kind of nonsensical stuff. I know everybody's, everybody's experienced the, well, I've stared at this code for four hours. I don't know what's wrong with it. I have no idea. And then somebody goes, oh, yeah, you've got to capitalize that. And you're just like, oh. And you go home and you're like, and drink 10 beers the night instead of one. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I hope everybody that hasn't goes and checks out some continuous integration, continuous delivery. And if you're doing it already, thank you. Keep doing it. It's awesome.